Welcome to the Introverted Doctor podcast, dedicated to uncovering myths, mistakes, and misconceptions that hold healthcare professionals back from having better interpersonal relationships with their patients and colleagues. In each episode, we focus on different aspects of a doctor's and other allied healthcare professional's life, such as communication techniques, mindset, routines, habits, and behaviors, with the goal to show how to eliminate anxiety, trip-ups, and unwelcomed results that comes from ineffective communications. I'll reveal research routines and we'll have some amazing guests in future podcasts that will help shine light on a particular topic. At the end of this podcast, I'll summarize the key tips so that you can apply or reapply them right away to start living your best life at work, home, and play. To subscribe to this podcast, please click on the link below or download it on your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I'm your host, Dr. Lalit Chavla. Take a listen and join me. This interview is unlike any other. It's difficult to find a person with this level of experience and wisdom. I've known Dr. John Crosby for many years through his articles in the Medical Post, where he's a regular contributor. He's also done peer reviews on fellow physicians for College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. And in, and in this interview, he's also been quite honest and candid about how he himself failed a peer review, but learned from that. He is remarkable at 72 years of age and still practicing medicine with full of energy. In this episode, we talk about all kinds of things from dealing with mean doctors, how an introverted doctor or person should deal with a bully doctor, especially if you're a person who avoids conflict like I am and also like Dr. John, Dr. John Crosby does as well. And he doesn't really like conflict, but he shares how he handles that. He talks about very specific language to use in that regard. His language is interesting and insightful, and sometimes uh, some of the things he's going to say may even shock you. He also shares tips from how doctors should deal with and avoid college complaints, how to deal with paperwork, and why he loves it so much. He talks about marriage, his fun fund, and how to plan a vacation, and how to complain properly. He's quite candid about many things in this regard, and he's candid about his personal challenges and tribulations as a doctor. He shares how he hated family medicine, but then learned how to love it. He talks about why laziness is good and how it helped him. He tells it like it is and explains why doctors are not wonderful. There's too much to mention in this interview, and he's always uh, bringing up great insights into the medical profession. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. John Crosby as much as I did, uh, who labels himself as the kindly country quack. He is truly a remarkable individual. I hope you enjoy this conversation. John, welcome to the show. I am very excited to have you here today. I've read many of your articles in the Medical Post, so this is a real honor to have you here. Um, I always wanted to ask you, you know, you call yourself the kindly country quack. So tell me, uh, how how did that name come about? Uh, It was from my brother-in-law, Peter Lougheed, who is a Toronto teacher, and I'm out here in Cambridge. So whenever we uh, went into Toronto, He'd say, you know, how's the kindly country quack doing? You know, just making fun of me. So, when I needed a blog handle, I thought that was brilliant to use that. So, it's been like that ever since. Oh, that's nice. That's funny. Now you're seventy-two years old. Seventy-two years old. You've been practicing for forty-six years yes, as a that's doctor. Correct. Yeah. That is a a long time to be doing anything, <laughs> and some of my listeners probably aren't even that old, but. That is great because you're, you'll be a master at what you do. Now, the, your recent Medical Post uh, article that you wrote, you said you, you grew up in Sarnia. You had a very uh, great life, almost a, like a priv- privileged life, an I- idyllic life. And you never really 
experienced any difficulty and then you somewhere along the way you developed empathy was there a particular point or a, uh, a story that you can share that that allowed you to change not not one specific thing it was a whole it was really life you know i sort of grew up i matured i think most doctors are like me you know we're really lucky you know it's it's lucky to be a doctor and it's hard to empathize with patients that smoke and eat too much and you know have bad marriages and things like that so once i've lived life and had kids and been married and had parents die and friends die uh, i had a lot more empathy for people so did that make you initially or, or did, like how would you describe yourself as a doctor initially until you ran into those yeah. tough times well i just couldn't understand people like they they made me angry and i like why can't you stop smoking why can't you stop eating why why don't you leave your abusive husband you know why why do you work at a crappy job <laughs> now i know the answer you know cuz you have to i mean you just oh, it's hard to to do all that stuff i'd never had to do anything so i i i had no empathy for them so now i have empathy and and that makes me a lot better family doctor because i'm you know, I don't judge them. I think that's the biggest, and I think uh, we are all bad as doctors, especially smoking. You know, very few doctors smoke, and we. I used to listen over where their cigarette pack was, saying, "I think I know where the the problem is," you know, and just my body language and stuff. So now I don't judge them, you know, and I go, "I know how hard it is, and I'll try to help you." So it, I'm becoming a human. Do Do you think you were? A bad doctor, or or, or difficult, mm -hmm. or, uh, or you'd have to ask my patients. Okay, I guess yeah, that's yeah, not I, a, that's not a fair question. No, it is. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I was young and I, I didn't have any complaints. Uh, I I enjoyed it then. I just I, I was actually bored by it. I thought, oh, how sick can you be if, if you can see me at Tuesday at three in the afternoon? So, so then I went into emergency medicine, which was really exciting. So that was really fun, and I did that for 20 years, and that was great. And then what made you decide to go back into family medicine? Um, it was just the lifestyle. I was 45 years old. I had three kids, uh, one when I was 42, and my wife was 38, so <laughs> it was a late dad. And uh, their whole world is 9 to 5, and when you're an eMERGE doctor, it's you know you're working on sociable hours, nights, holidays, weekends. I wanted to be with my family. So with great trepidation, I came back here to be a family doctor uh, 27 years ago, and, and I was really nervous about it. I thought, geez, what if I screw it up again? But luckily, I, I changed. I really had changed myself, and I changed the processes. So now I love it. I mean, I look forward to going to work every day. So what would be some key processes uh, that you changed that you think that some doctors are making a mistake at? Yeah currently what do you think are things that um, you see that many doctors mm -hmm. I don't think doctors are making mistakes they they just fall into it I mean you come out you're you're tired you're in debt you, you just start working really hard to pay back your debt you just you work faster and faster and harder and harder and you start missing breakfast and breaks you, you start working through your lunch you know you're grabbing a sandwich between patients and typing and stuff and you show up home at seven at night exhausted and you, you, you didn't start your life like that. It, it just kind of happened to you. So when I came back, I was really aware of that. I was older. I had mentors. I think the most important thing you can do as a doctor is get a mentor, you know, get an older doctor that's been successful and just listen to what they tell you and, and try to emulate what they say. Uh, you know, my dad always said, you know, s smart people learn from their mistakes. Wise people learn from the mistakes of others. So <laughs> I hear you. That is a great saying. And, and that's what I'm trying to do, really, with this podcast and my articles. And I offer free mentorships is, is I've made tons of mistakes so new young doctors don't have to. And, and, and that's how we educate ourselves as humans. I mean, when we were cavemen and women, uh, if you burned yourself on the fire, you told your kids not to touch the fire. So they didn't have to burn their hands. And, and that's what education is, totally. Like, you know, don't kill the patient. Here's, here's how to, to do it uh, right. And here's the tricks of the trade. And, and when we go to medical school and residency, often our professors 
don't tell us that because they're so way up there in their ivory towers they don't know you know how do i be on time in my my busy general practice you know how how do i make sure i have an empty uh, in basket every day things nobody teaches you that at medical school so my role is to try to get the practical tricks of the trade so what did you do uh, some what were some couple processes that you made sure okay so I, I first got a mentor and, and my mentors said to me and you know one was Jim Cavanaugh who invented the TELUS uh, computer system that a lot of us use across Canada and he's my next door neighbor so I was lucky there and he said you know you don't have to marry the patients you don't have to own them you don't have they're not your best friends you're their doctor you don't have to fix all their problems sometimes you just have to listen to them sometimes you just have to reassure them uh, that was a huge thing. You know, I really had boundary issues before, you know, trying to fix everything. And I think as a family doctor, we rarely diagnose things. We rarely fix things. You know, it's often just chronic disease management. You, you don't get better from high blood pressure. You don't get better from diabetes or cholesterol, but we can help uh, and depression and anxiety. So we're sort of chronic disease managers. Well, we certainly do yeah, manage and making sure their blood pressure then diagnose the diabetes hypertension to make sure they don't have the negative sequelae mm -hmm. from from that so i i certainly agree with that yeah. and i certainly agree that sometimes people may not be ready for the change that they that you would like to see and sometimes really we have to be patient we have to be patient with their timing because sometimes our timing mm -hmm. is just it's just not yeah. what it's meant to be. And that's what I had to learn because I was so impatient. Because I, you know, why can't everybody be as fast? Like my mom was fast, my sister's fast, I'm just a fast person. So it was great in Emerge. I mean, I could juggle 20 patients that one, one of the medical students said to me, this is like air traffic control. I mean, you've got like 20 planes in the air. And I said, yeah, I hope none of them crash. So, so coming to be a GP and then you're talking to a 100 year old lady. Uh, it just you have to just be very patient or like smokers like I've had six smokers where I nagged them for 22 years and they finally quit after 22 years so 22 years is a lot different than you know a, a two-minute cardiac arrest so so I've really had to slow myself down and just keep you know gnawing away at people and and, and not being frustrated by it not yeah. getting angry about it I, I used to be angry and judge them and it's your fault and you're a bad patient and Nobody's bad. I mean, you're just a human, and, and we, we need to get have to teach them tricks of the trade as well. So a lot of the stuff I teach uh, to student, medical students and residents and interns and nurse practitioners and physician assistants and graduate doctors, I teach them to my uh, secretary and nurses and patients as well. So you know everybody needs to be educated about all this stuff all the time, and plus me being educated back by them. Now, you know, talking about, you know, saying the patient is bad, uh, you, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, if, but I've certainly had the experience where I've seen other doctors in the emergency room or just <clears throat> sometimes in a clinical setting where they're just um, not nice and mm -hmm. or they're just, you know, frankly, sometimes they're just mean uh, at times. Do you think that... Uh, why is why why do they behave that way? Because I don't think people go into these any helping profession to you know certainly not for the money. Right. And um, if you really think about the hours that the, the average doctor, nurse, physiotherapist, the, the amount they put in, certainly you know if you count all that, you know spread out the financial aspect of it why do you think people why are behave? some doctors crabby yeah or, or crabby and even sometimes um, abusive abusive yeah. no i think you're right and, and i've run into those doctors too and, and i've been lucky you know i'm i've got a pretty nice disposition and i'm always happy and and i even when i feel bad and i'm in a lousy mood you know and i'm grumpy or i got a cold or something I try to suck it up and be nice to patients just for the the simple reason it's it's much easier to be nice than it is to be nasty 
And a great way to get sued or get a college complaint is if you're nasty. Like patients tend to not sue their doctors if they like them. So and I had an example. I was chief of staff at a hospital years ago, and we had an emergency doctor who had 37 complaints about him in one year. And, you know, I used to run an eMERGE in Ontario where we used to get one complaint a year for the whole, whole eMERGE, you know, 50,000 visits. It was just wonderful because we had wonderful nurses and really good doctors and we were on time. People weren't gr crabby because they'd waited 12 hours. So so we had to call this guy into the office to say, why do you have 37 complaints about you? And and he started crying in front of me. And you know, he was like a 40-year-old guy and he just said, you know, I'm I'm broke. I, I owe money. I'm, I'm working double shifts, I'm exhausted, I'm just so crabby, I'm so depressed, I can't sleep. So he had a real mental health problem and he was taking it out on the patients. So uh, so that was, it was good. You have to sort of say, what's behind this behavior? Is the person clinically depressed? Are they burnt out? Are they working too hard, too many hours? You know, especially with mm -hmm. doctors, are you on call too much? So, uh, so we fixed this guy, it actually was great, you know, we we said, I acted like his realtor. I said, why don't you sell your house and rent, pay off all your debts, because uh, the house is the only thing they don't tax for us, so it's tax-free. So in those days, you'd, probably a house would be worth $500,000, which would buy you a dog house now in Toronto. <laughs> so uh, we said, sell your house, get out of debt, and then... And he did, and he and it worked. And mm. he we he had like four complaints the next year. So I mean, he's he's never going to go down to zero complaints. Mm -hmm. Like he's he was kind of a grumpy guy and felt people were abusing the emergency department all the time. Uh, he was very judgmental. So, but we took him from thirty-seven complaints to four complaints, just tr as his financial advisor and not not his medical advisor. Well, well, that is huge. So. You may be really good at dealing with that, but how would somebody, say, who's more introverted or shy or conflict-averse, mm. because I know sometimes that is that tends to be my behavior, is maybe sometimes avoid the situation altogether. Yeah. How do you approach that? How would you, what kind of, kind, of, kind of advice would you give? Well, and I'm like that, too. I hate... Uh, getting in battles with people. I'm terrible at it, and I try to avoid it at all costs. And and that's tough as a doctor because you've got to say no to narcotics. You've got to say no to time off work. So we're, we're in conflict constantly, and people are mad at us, and we're in the middle with a lot of stuff. So so number one, I call it rent-a-spine. So I, my secretary has got a really good spine, and she's great, and she can say no to people, and they don't even know they're being said no to. Like one of my multimillionaire uh, patients said, I would love to have your secretary as my secretary because she can blow people off and they don't even know they're being blown off. So she's great. And, and I've had one complaint about her in 27 years, you know, from a crack addict that wanted to see me immediately. So she's just, I lucked into her. I mean, she was here when I took over the practice. So, But I treat her well and I give her lots of money and lots of time off work and praise her and... So, you know, we have a great working relationship between us. So she's my rent a spine. Like so so people for example, like somebody will call up and say, uh, I hate my job, I hate my boss, my coworkers. Um, tell Dr. Crosby I need two months off, you know, for stress leave. And she's just great. She starts right away, she says, Well, Dr. Crosby doesn't believe in a lot of time off for stress because you're just running away from your problem. And she's already starting my oh, nice. spiel on the phone because she knows how I work. Yeah. So, you know, and, and she, he wants he he might give you two weeks off and uh, try and not a holiday, but just get counseling, get help, uh, talk to human resources. You know, if it's an abuse situation, get a new job, things like that. So, so when they come into me, she's already taken them from two months to two weeks. So she, you know, her spine has replaced my lack of spine. So I'm not arguing with them and they're mad. They go out mad at me and I'm a horrible person and, you know, and I feel bad and they slam the door and stuff. So, so they come in already thinking like I do. But how do you deal with it when you can't rent a spine, you know, <laughs> when you're in the, in the hospital and you're, 
you have to deal with a particular doctor or, or a colleague uh, or, or somebody you're working with. And d frankly, their agenda doesn't yeah. uh, doesn't line up with the greater purpose or uh, and maybe, you know, there's bullying behavior or tactics. Right. Like, how do you deal with well, that? And, and the way you treat a bully is with a bigger bully. That's the secret to treating bullies. Hmm. So you've so you've got to get a bigger bully. So. And I've had that situation, you know, as chief of staff and as head of nursing home and, and just as a colleague. So I'll try. To, first of all, if there's trouble, you don't want to deal with it on the ward or in front of other people. You want to take that person away to another room where you're private together. You know, turn off your iPhones so you're not going to be interrupted. Don't try to decompress the situation. You don't want to have a fight in front of the nurses and stuff So, and staff. So... And then you always want to hear their side first and said, and I'm really honest with people. I go, you seem really upset. You seem really angry. And I do that with patients too. Patients that are angry, I, I will say, you know, you seem really angry. Like what is upsetting you? Because it may be something totally you don't, you know, my, my dog just died or I just got a diagnosis of cancer. So you don't know what's going on in their life. If they're just a nasty person that's bullying a nurse or something, uh, then and, and I have done this, you know, I will stand up to people and I'll say, you know, that's unacceptable behavior and that's not helping the patient. It's not helping you. It's not helping the nurse. It's a lose, lose, lose. And it's a great way to get sued or get a college complaint. So I put, I always put things in their best interest. You know, the doctor, the mm -hmm. nurse, the patient, always people care about themselves. So you always want to, to do that. What, what's best for you? You know, being a bully is not good for you. And I'm sure, you know, you're not happy doing it either. That is a uh, good language. Do, would you ever say that, being a bully? Isn't yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, I say. Yeah. And I'm really honest with people. I, you know, one of my pet peeves is people that use euphemisms and stuff like, yeah. you know, pass away and passed over and pat your dad passed. And I always went, a kidney stone or passed out or oh, okay. like use the word die. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with dying. We all die. We've got a 100% failure rate as doctors. All our patients die. I mean, I always joke, how would you, if you imagine if you worked at uh, Ford Motor Company and you had a 100% failure rate. Well, we as doctors have a 100% failure rate. All our patients die. So I hate that euphemism where, you know, use the real words with people. You know, your dad is going to die. Uh, and that, you know, people appreciate that. They don't like all these fuzzy words that doctors use. That, that's a pet peeve I have with medical people. Speak plain English or French. That is good advice. That's good advice. Because I you. do think we, you know, do obfuscate. use... Obfuscate. <laughs> What's that? We obfuscate. There's a big word. There's a big word. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> Note to self. Using but, big words to say <laughs> when we should use little words. So, um, yeah, we do use euphemisms. And one thing I know I have to be mindful of is, especially when talking to patients, is the use of language, things like benign, malignant, yeah. uh, you Good know, point. basal cell carcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. Yeah. You know, they don't, they, know, they, they don't know the difference. And we ourselves get so wrapped up in or because it's 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 inherent to yeah. us. We know it, it's but hard they don't know. necessarily know yeah. it. So well, I have a funny story about that. I had, there was this old GP in Oakville when I was the head of Emerge and he said, you know, you always write F-U-F-P on all the bottoms of your charts, and that was follow-up family physician. And he said, you know, for like five years, I thought you were swearing at me. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> F-U, family physician. So then I started to realize, you know, you have to use the real words with people. Like S-O-B is shortness of breath. It means different things to other people. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's a pet peeve with any presentation. I, whenever I teach uh, how to teach I always say never use short forms on your PowerPoint because you don't know your audience, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you know, ED could be emergency department, erectile dysfunction, executive director. So use the full word there. You've got lots of room on a PowerPoint slide. Like never use short forms because you don't know who's going to read your stuff or be at your talk or, or yeah. what, what patient it is. So, And one trick too, so you don't, uh, patients don't feel they're being talked down to as I use two words. So I'll say you have a fractured, broken arm because some people think fracture is different than a break or um, 
any trouble going to the bathroom, you know, pooping or peeing or having a bowel movement. So I'll use them all in a sentence and mm -hmm. they can pick out the one that they're comfortable with, especially people with English as a second language as well. Yeah. Because so, they'll just sit there and nod, you know, or no, I don't have trouble with the I don't know what the hell a bowel movement is, you know. Mm -hmm. So you got to talk the lingo to them. And I talk about in one previous episode about the how important it is to give proper discharge instructions. Yes. Because uh, one, to the true story, I don't know if you, you know about this, but this emergency room doctor, this ch child came in basically was, uh, having a lot of uh, diarrhea and vomiting. And he, and, and this was a really good conscious emergency room physician. I heard this from the CMPA. Uh, That's so, always a bad source. Well, they, well, they, they <laughs> were giving going to go bad. They gave it, they gave a, a CMPA yeah. Canadian medical protective Association. Yeah. you know, give, they gave this workshop and the doctor told the parents, you know, if nothing changes, then uh, bring him back if nothing changes. Okay. In their mind, well, yeah. nothing changed. They, the, the, the still child got vomiting and diarrhea. Still have oh vomiting and diarrhea, God. and the child died. Oh. So they're That's very hard. That's so sad, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It is. And, that, and everyone's innocent there, and then the kid's dead. And, well, yeah. and, and that's where I, that was a good lesson for me to hear on, because when I give discharge instructions, and I, I'm very clear, yeah. you know, if it continues to have vomiting, diarrhea, blah, 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 yeah. bring it back. If you're concerned, bring him back at this time. You know, he should be improving in 24 to 48 hours less of this these are signs and yeah. things to look out i don't want to scare them but I, and i tell no, them that's... this is so that for your education so that you're aware not saying that it's going to happen but if that chest pain escalates and it becomes deeper whatever you need to go to the emergency yeah. room that's great advice. And, and also, I always give them written instructions. And, and I learned ah. this tip in Cambridge Emerge, actually. On every door, they had all the instructions on one piece of paper. So you weren't running around trying to get 10 different pieces of paper. And it was on every door, just outside the door in, in a slot. So Because you, you, you can't find anything in an ER. And so I did this in my family practice. So it's in the computer now. I can just hit my hand out. And I've got a handout for kids that covers head injury and fever and things like that, mm -hmm. and vomiting, diarrhea, when to call the doctor, when to go back to emerge, what to look for, you know, fever, stuff like that, head injury routine. So you're, and I do that with most of the stuff I do in medicine. It's nice having a computer. I just print out my instructions and hand it to them. And my secretary makes fun of me. She says, I find half of them in the garbage. They, they throw them out. They ignore you, except for the teachers and the librarians. And I said, well, teachers and librarians are, are worthwhile. So even well, if half of them throw them out, half of them didn't throw them yeah. out. And you don't know which half is it's keeping them. Is exactly. keeping them, and uh, and it's probably not half. Would be well. My and, guess. and another trick I do on the computer too is, like, I'll go through things like uh, advice for sleep or weight loss or anything, any of the big problems we have, smoking and that. And I'll actually go through on the computer with the patient. Here's all the tips for weight loss. Here's all the tips for sleep. And then I'll print it out to them. And then I will say. I want you to read this and bring it back in a week, and we're going to go over it again like homework. So they can't throw it out. This And half the time they throw it out, but at least they know in a week from now. And I said, let's go through the list again. And that's when I, it's great. I think that's the best thing I've ever learned, really, as a GP, because a lot of the times they don't do the things you ask. So I'll, they have insomnia, and I'll say, well, did you give up all caffeine? Well, no, I can't. You know, I have to have my triple-triple every morning. And so then we, we talk about that. And we said, you know, people with insomnia should have zero caffeine ever. You can't even look at a cup of coffee, you know. And that's hard to get off. So we're going to have to wean you down, you know, half calf for a week. And you're going to mm -hmm. have withdrawal symptoms. So things like that where they'll argue with you or, or nap. A big thing is napping. I said no naps ever. If you feel like a nap, you've got to go for a while. If you have a nap, you're not going to sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh, I just couldn't give up my nap. I was exhausted. So 
So I may take three or four visits to finally work them through their, because this is behavior modification and habits and stuff. Mm. And that's really rewarding because they actually get better and thank me for that instead of me throwing them a handout and them throwing it in the garbage and going out and then three years later they still have insomnia. So, and that's our job as family doctors and specialists too, is trying to change uh, human behavior, you know, which is the hardest thing in the world to do. And it's really, I call it the, like the low-hanging fruit, yes. because um, name. P- 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 people, you know, if, if they sleep better, they uh, stop watching TV and mm-hmm. and iPads an hour before bed. Exactly, that's another tip. You know, yeah. hydrate better, eating food better, and those are really things that I don't know if every physician. Yeah talks to them about i hear nurses they, they and, do and you that. talk they about do. that in your podcast yeah. too and that's good that you're getting the message out there and and that's where you yeah and you screen time is perfect I, we call them screenagers or teenagers mm-hmm. that are always on the screen <laughs> oh, isn't that a great line, that is a great line. <clears throat> and everybody loves their screens i mean we're all addicted including me mm-hmm. and i just love it i'm and yeah, you say to them two hours before bedtime you you've, you've got to read a book like you can't watch the news it's all bad it's always Trump doing this or that. And uh, you've, you've got to turn off all your screens because your brain thinks it's still daytime. So uh, cavemen and women didn't have that problem, you know. So yeah. so I'm always taught, and I, I use cavemen and women a lot saying, you know, there's uh, things we do because this is what we've inherited from our our uh, forebears. So we've, we've got to figure out tricks to fool ourselves and to do. I think that's when you, when I think about my life, my whole life is is teaching people tricks. Like you were an illusionist, <laughs> you taught you use tricks because I can't change them. I mean, I'm not going to change a patient or a doctor or a nurse, but I can show them tricks of the trade. Like, like I always go, you know, everybody hates paperwork and computer work. I mean, it's the number one burnout cause of all doctors. And I love it. I'm the only doctor in the entire world that loves paper. I will come to your office and do your paper for you. I love it so much because I have learned the tricks to loving paperwork. So what what, what are they? Okay, number one is uh, you have to have it in your schedule. Like most doctors do it at lunch or at supper on the weekend, which ruins your weekend and your supper. So it's in my schedule. It's right in my iPhone. It says 8 till 9 every weekday paperwork. It's right there, just like saying seeing Mr. Jones at 9 o'clock in the office. I have an appointment to do paperwork because it's part of our job. Like, stop whining about it. It's our job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You can't get rid of it. Everybody has paperwork. And, comp- and I use paperwork for computer work now because I'm down to about 1% paper and 99% computer. But I mean lab, x-ray, specialist, no, you know, all that stuff that pours over us. And and you, if you see three, 30 people a day, you're going to get 60 of those a day because, you know, lab, x-ray, specialist for almost everybody. So I do it every morning, 8 till 9 when I'm fresh. And then I reward myself. I have a reward. I have a coffee, decaf. I get to read the paper. Uh, so I'm rewarding myself. And, and it's done. I'm done for the day instead of letting... Because it'll just grow and grow and grow in your in-basket until... And then you don't want to go near it. You know, it, it, the bigger it gets, the less it is. If someone has a huge chart that you have to summarize for a lawyer, uh, it's going to take you two hours. I charge 300 bucks an hour. So that six hundred dollars makes me a very happy man. Makes me love, you know. Money can make me. <laughs> money can buy you happiness because, and I give that money to my wife to buy shoes. No, no, I, uh, I have two pairs of shoes. She has two hundred pairs of shoes, and she still needs more. But we have a fun fund, so she puts all this money from paperwork in the fun fund, and then you know we go to a Broadway play or a play in Toronto or we go to a Blue Jays game and not her I get to go to that or a Raptors game you know you can take out a mortgage on a Raptors ticket from the scalpers uh, so I'm rewarding myself instead of saying this is horrible I hate it I hate paperwork I love paperwork bring me your paperwork because I'm getting paid for it uh, for this is private stuff you know for make make lawyers pay they're going to charge a thousand bucks to the client <clears throat> things like that so tricks of the trade you know do you 
you know, ever complain. I mean, you, you <laughs> yeah. seem so oh, yeah. you seem so positive, like uh, all yes, the time. I ask my wife. You know, I come home, and this is she's good for me too, because I come home at five o'clock at night on time, and I just sit there and bitch for uh, ten minutes, and then she goes, "Okay, that's it. You, you're allowed to complain for ten minutes and then move on." So I don't ruminate about it. But you ha everyone needs to complain about it. And complaining is a good thing. I agree. I, I know when I was an emergency doctor, I used to call it stitch and bitch. The nurses would be, at four in the morning, they would be stitching away and making quilts and that because there's no patients and that. And I'd be back sleeping and they'd be complaining, you know, about their kids and their husband and their job and stuff. But it was like group therapy. They were getting it out and, and you know, lancing the boil. So Well, you brought up a very good point in that uh, there is a technique uh, where you actually schedule time to complain. <laughs> so, Sounds like a Monty Python skit. No, but but you but, but you actually <laughs> you want to complain. So that's you but you, you do it to your wife, and she puts the time limit that's on it, brilliant. and that's it. So I should put it in my iPhone. Complain time. Well, five to five ten. And and really, uh, that is actually a technique. It's like you know, I'm too busy. I'm not going to be focusing on this negative. Yeah. Mo these these things at 5 to 5.30 that's great. or 5 to 5.10 I'm going to complain and that's it well that's what I love about this is and my blog too I get feedback and when I give speeches around the world I get feedback from the audience they're fabulous I and then I spread those great ideas to everyone I feel like a little bumblebee you know pollinating all the uh, different flowers and stuff so I collect all these great tips and then send them out to everybody it, and you've got to do it simply. If you give too much information to yeah. people, their head just explodes. Yeah. So that was a good tip. I always remember the pharmacists were always whining at the nursing home how we were using all these stupid short forms like OD for every day. And that means actually your right eye, oculodextra. So they put a whole list of all the things doctors did wrong on their prescriptions and I said, you're making a mistake because doctors hate all this stuff and they're just going to toss this. They're not going to look at it. So once a week, send one email saying, this week's tip from pharmacy is don't use OD, write once daily. Uh, don't write, uh, you know, so so they will learn that, you know, and, and they have to get back to you by email so you know they read it. So please acknowledge you got this email. Mm -hmm. so, so little things, and I think you're doing that with your podcast and I try to do that with my blogs. Uh, and I know the College of Physicians and Surgeons is doing this now. I interviewed the president, and she said, she's an obstetrician from St. Thomas, Nancy Whitmore, and she said, we're going to send out just one little tip from the college a month instead of, you know, 10 pages, which you're going to just explode over because you've got so much paperwork. We're just going to give a quick little paragraph on how to avoid, you know, this kind of problem that gets doctors into trouble with the college. So, yeah, because we are in information, paper overload, email overload, overload and everything. Uh, it's hard to keep, keep up. It just kills you. Oh, one last thing about paperwork is I always do it in front of the patient. So if they come in with workers' comp, we do it together because they know, can you bend? How long have you been off? So mm -hmm. I, I do it when it's there. If you put that in your in-basket, it will grow and have babies. Be and I, that people think that's a joke, but it has babies because you'll get more paper coming saying what happened to the first paper. So and then they're mad at you because they don't get paid, and so everyone's mad. Your secretary's mad at you because she's you know drowning in all your paper. So this is a win-win-win. You're happy you have no paperwork. They're happy they get paid. Secretary's happy. Instead of lose, 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 you get win-win-win, and that's a trick of the trade. Doing it right there in front of them. And and ca staying ahead, because I know if I've ever in the past let it pile up, it's very daunting. It's, it's actually depressing to, to look at the pile. And, and you don't do it. Well, uh, <laughs> th th you're forced to do it at some point. Yeah. So, I, But I have a routine. My routine is usually Saturday mornings. I would, I'd wake up early, have a coffee, and then I do it. And then anything that I need patients to come into, they'll, I'll, I'll need to do an assessment or whatever. I'll yeah. talk to them. Well, that's good. So it's yeah, no, and if my patient gives me a big fat chart, I'll just write in on it. So then the patient has to come in, and then I can't procrastinate. They're sitting in front of me, so I can't blow it off. Mm -hmm. And one last tip, too, is when I'm on vacation, I always come back a day early right to this very desk. So, And it's actually the best. This is how sick I am. This is the happiest day of my vacation. I would rather be here than at Disney World. 
you know, dying of the heat and, and buying $10 waters with, for my five-year-old grandson. So I come back a day early and I turn off everything. No phones, no iPhones, no secretary, no patients, no nurses, no family, nobody, just me alone. And I spend eight hours here in absolute uh, heaven getting caught up on all my computers. So I start the next day ahead of myself. Instead, but you have to put that in your schedule. You have to fly in a day early instead of flying in at night and being exhausted and crabby. And then you've blown your whole vacation. You know, you you need a vacation to, for your vacation. That, that is actually a great tip. I've done that a few times. And when I've done it, I'm like, why don't I do this all the time? Because that extra day, even if it's like if you're six or eight hours ahead of yeah. it. it, it changes the level of it's energy life. Yeah. it totally changes the level of energy and it's actually an investment on your vacation that's but, a good point you know the secret to that is once again another trick is when you're coming home from vacation put in your iphone the next vacation right in there say the day day off before i get home so you're always thinking ahead of yourself like, like this year my wife and i were just overloaded the first of july we had a, like a million things happening and we were just exhausted and angry and crabby and complaining and and we said we never want to do that again but we'll forget and do it next july 1st because we're so stupid we can't remember so i put it in my iphone it says may 2020 don't schedule anything for July 1st. So, Because I'll go, oh, yeah, I remember last summer we, we ruined, instead of having a fun July 1st, we had a crummy July 1st because we overprogrammed ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you can use this time management stuff for your private life as well. You know, you need to prioritize stuff. And, and with doctor vacations, I always say, plan your vacations a year in advance and send an email to everybody in your life, you know, the hospital, your call group, your spouse, your friends, your family, everyone that it is that you are involved in your entire life, the nursing home, uh, and then it's there. So they know you're going to be off July 1st to July 14th. Because if you try to do that in June, you're in big trouble. But if, if you always said, I've already got my schedule fixed for the next year. So I actually, uh, in, 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 at home, I have a, I take a 12 month calendar. I open it up and I have it on on the wall, so like the full wow. big ones, and so I <laughs> schedule life twelve months ahead of That's time. That's great because I need to. I'm a visual person. Yeah. I need to visually see it. So so I'm I know where I'm at, and then as the, and then as the months pass on, I will extend more more time. Just keep going in. Months. Yeah yeah. So anywhere if you look on my wall, there's about twelve <laughs> months to eighteen months. That's great. But then. Also, at the end of the year, I uh, look back. I do a recap of the year. My daughter kind of mm. saw this recap one time. She thought, 2017. She said, what are you doing here? But I actually mm. recap all the things, the highlights of the year, what I've done, the conferences, uh, where did we go on vacation. So if I, if I look back, I'll say okay, 2014 was the year of this, 2015. Wow, so it, it's kind of a fun thing to do. That's a great idea. It makes you feel good. Makes you feel yeah. good. You 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 look at it's kind of like progress. Okay, this year I, I did actually this. did something. I did yeah. I actually did something. Yeah. That's a great idea. So, See another tip. And so uh, I I I I totally agree with you about booking a vacation ahead of time. When I was in residency, uh, my mentor, Dr. Greg Archibald, I remember him saying to me, he said, I, I, I think he said, you know, when you have your first vacation planned, always have another one scheduled two or three months ahead of time, and you should have a week off. You should always schedule it because you will burn out. You need something to look forward to. to. And to look back on. And, you know, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you for reminding me. And uh, we call it the Tarzan method mm -hmm. because Tarzan was going through the jungle on a vine and he's always looking for his next vine to swing to. So we're always, my wife and I are always planning a vacation on our vacation. And and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, we, we had three boys and a secret to a good medical marriage is you have to go away alone, just you and your spouse. Because a lot of people, when they get kids, and this all marriages, 
you get kids and you focus in on the kids and you forget about the spouse and all of a sudden the kids are all gone in 20 years and you're strangers and you see these late uh, divorces, you know, because they're just strangers because the kids are gone. So we always, for our 44 years of our marriage, we always do a week with the kids and then a week alone. So like we'll do February alone in the Caribbean and then March break with the kids skiing, you know, and in New York State or, or, you know, just drive to Collingwood or something near here in Cambridge. And then kids are at the at camp in the summer. We're alone at the cottage. So our marriage, we always have alone time together. And I see that with my patients, too. I'll say, when's the last time you went away alone with your spouse? And it's like five years ago. And, and that's a great way to get divorced. That is a good point. Now, did you have somebody to take care of the kids when yeah, they're younger we, and that's another good thing we have a nanny and i recommend to all <clears throat> doctors out there and and i can say this without being sexist because a woman surgeon told me she said what women doctors need is a wife you know before yeah. you write in and say i'm a sexist pig that's a woman surgeon saying that uh and she said, you know, her husband was an anesthetist, and she said, we spend $40,000 a year on a nanny, and it's wonderful. We come home, the kids are well looked after, the dinner's on the table, the laundry's done, the house is clean, we have a glass of wine together instead of fighting with each other and trying to cook dinner. And so it saves marriages. And that's how male doctors have survived for thousands of years. They always had a wife looking after everybody at home. You know, when you hear how hard they worked, well, because they didn't do anything at home. So now that us younger, uh, more liberated people, like my dad never changed a diaper, and I help out about probably 40%, so I'm as good as most men. And new young men are much better than we were. So we always had a nanny to look after our kids when we went away alone. And, and you can get family, too, although, yeah. I mean, our moms were so old by that time <laughs> They were worn out by my sisters. I never even thought about the, getting a nanny just for that week, but that's no, a good... we had a nanny all yeah, the but, time. But no, because my wife was a week. flight attendant. I was an emergency doctor, so we had crazy schedules. Like, mm. she'd be in Germany, I'd be in Oakville. So we were all... We were we didn't work long hours. Like, I emerge docs only work 28 hours a week. Nobody knows that. Don't tell anybody. And flight attendants work 35 hours a month, but they're weird hours. So we would have a nanny for one or two days a week just to make sure we weren't, if she got stuck in Germany, you know, I was, and I had to do a night shift, that's when you have stress and burnouts. So, mm -hmm. But that's how we worked there. But I mean, you could even, if you don't have the money for a nanny, you can swap. So you can get another couple to look after your kids for a week, and then you can do their kids for, you know, when your kids get older, like nine or 10. Mm -hmm. But even when we had infants, you know, even when we had one-year-olds, we would go away for a week. And and that's really been good for our marriage. And you, you have to put your marriage first. Your marriage is more important than your kids because your kids will be gone. And if you, you have a good marriage, then you will be able to raise good children. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to have a solid team because it's a tag team match. You know, it takes two of you. Well, uh, my wife, she's a professional and she works. And um, I can tell you that I and watching and I have a lot of friend, women friends who are nurses, physiotherapists, doctors. And I think women work twice as hard mm -hmm. as men because they, they not only do the work outside of the home, but they're also running mm -hmm. all the things at, at home, in, really in most cases. So it's... Uh, it's true. It's very And they have way more burnout than men. Yes, and understandably so. Yeah, because men dump everything on women, including me. Every man. Show me a man that's a 50-50 with a woman... And I'm pretty close. Like, I scrub toilets. I really do. Like, I do. I really try to help my wife. But we have a cleaning lady, too. I mean, mm -hmm. so we make good money, so I try to pay to buy happiness, I call it. And it's worth it. So these are, once again, trick of the trade. Here's a trick. Mm -hmm. Go away alone with your spouse. Here's a trick. Get a nanny. Get a cleaning lady. You're making good money. Rich people support them. Do you think Harry and Meghan are up at 3 in the morning with Archie? I mean, they have nannies and cleaning ladies. and yeah. The rich have always done that since time began. And the poor don't have a lot of stressors because they're in one room and that with their kids. It's the middle class, upper middle class doctors that are doing all the work at their jobs and all the work at home and cutting the grass. And they're just exhausted by it. And that's why they're burnt out. You know, the rich and poor have figured it out. It's, it's us in the middle 
that have, you know, it's all about your support systems. And I'm saying that like my secretary is my support system. The nurses at the nursing home are my, that's, I delegate to them. They do all the work and I come in and consult and make sure it's done right. That's the whole essence of time management, which leads to stress management, which helps you avoid burnout. One we we've never done that like the week vacation uh, i've never doctor's but, orders <laughs> but the i mean it's, it's good advice um <laughs> what's your old hip number <laughs> <laughs> but what we, we do do is we have date night that's generally good. once a week and good for you. and it's just my wife and i will go watch a movie go go have dinner and just spend yeah. that quality time there was a billboard that uh that really captures, I think, an uh, important message. It said, uh, a babysitter is much cheaper than a marriage counselor oh, wow. or a divorce lawyer. That is awesome. You know, so, what a great line. Yeah, that, that, You've got to email me these ideas. <laughs> I forget stuff. So. Well, it'll be on the podcast. Yeah, you can listen you. back. I'll <laughs> write it down. But, great uh, idea. And, and it's true. I had a date night yesterday with my wife. We went to see uh, the live production of Grease and then went to a ritzy restaurant. So still in love after 44 years. 54 with the wind chill factor. <laughs> but I urge you to take a week alone with your wife because the secret to a vacation is when you don't know what day it is. You know, you're sitting there on the beach going, is it Tuesday or Thursday? That's your secret. You know, you've turned off your iPhone. It's just the two of you the way you used to be. You need to get a week away where you can just do nothing to get, and just say nothing. Just be alone. To, no kids, no relatives, no friends, no family. And doctors are the worst because we have an excuse to be on our iPhones. We can say, oh, we're delivering babies and we're talking to patients and that. So doctors get more burnout than anybody else in the world because we can say, oh, and aren't I a wonderful guy? I'm working till 10, saving lives and stamping out diseases. You know, if you're a banker saying that, you're just a, you know, a greedy banker. But if you're a doctor saying that, aren't you a wonderful person? No, you're not a wonderful person. You're disorganized. You're divorced. You know, you don't know your kids. You're an alcoholic. Uh, you're taking drugs. You're, there's something wrong with you. You don't need to work till 10 o'clock every night. You get your job done by 5 uh, and then sign out to a call group. And, and that's another thing I did here in Cambridge because I'm lazy and I hate being on call. I, d I designed a call system, for, and it's been running for 25 years, where you're only on call one night a month, which is, talk about a burnout cure. Mm -hmm. And once again, turning it from an po a negative to a positive. So when you're on call, <clears throat> you take the next day off. So you're rewarding. Everybody goes, I hate being on call. I'm up all night. I'm exhausted. I'm crabby. Burnout. Terrible patient care. Yelling at the nurses. Crabby. This is great. I only do it once a month. I'm taking the day off afterwards. I'm going to spoil myself. On, I'm going to drive to Toronto alone and go to the art gallery and go to a nice restaurant and just be alone with myself for the whole day and do exactly what I want to do. And so I'm rewarding myself instead of punishing myself. So you turn it right. Instead, I love paperwork. I love being on call. I love annoying patients because I'm going to turn them around. So, so turn everything around that pisses. Can I say piss you off? Well, uh, <laughs> Will that sure, be edited sure. out? <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's Sorry. fine. I, Annoys I, you. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. So always say, why am I being annoyed by this? And how can I flip it up? Say, what's Dr. Crosby's trip trick to flip this? That's a good idea. Yeah. I'll read his ebook, and he's got a trick for everything. That, and it's taken me forty six years to get these tricks. So I will give them to you in forty six minutes. I'll I'll share that with yeah. the. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes, and we and, and we'll we'll come back to that. Thanks. Yeah. And I have an audio book too, because uh, a lot of doctors don't have time to read my ebook. They're so far behind. So you can just listen to it while you're driving hands free in the car. To kind of change the subject a bit now. You know, there's been, I've noticed in the last two or three years, and, and other doctors have said this to me. Uh, I had a couple doctors, they wanted me to ask you this question. Do you feel that uh, the that doctor, sometimes, like, they've, they have felt that in the public that they're, they've been a bit more vilified or they, they in... <clears throat> 
and actually in some ways they in in some good ways actually they've been taken off their pedestal mm-hmm. but um there's some some doctors feel that there's a resentment towards yeah. them because they feel they've they make a lot of money they they don't know about the overheads and how much we pay and the hours we work what is your perspective because you've seen certainly <laughs> from yeah. from the beginning of uh, time uh, well, for, <laughs> from, for a long time yes how doctors were at top but and then things have changed yeah. and in many well, good ways for sure I mean, 46 years and i've seen a massive change like i literally was at the very end of the of what doctors were like for thousands of years like when i started in 73 even in a cambridge is you know a middle-sized town you know it's bigger than chatham of course, everything is, but uh, it's like there's 150,000 people here. So that's a good mid-sized town in Canada. And we did everything. I mean, there was no emergency doctors. You used to get up at three in the morning to go up to the, you had to drive up to the emerge to see someone with a heart attack. That was just crazy. Uh, deliver all our own babies, look after the hospital, house calls, office. Like we did everything. We did everything that a small town doctor does today in a large city. Uh, and uh, so I've seen the entire change in going from being a full service doctor to now I'm just nine to five, Monday to Friday in my office. I'm not even on call anymore because my wonderful call system that I invented let me go off call at age 65, seven years ago. So I was even thinking of the future back when I was young and foolish. Uh, so, so I've seen it all. And I'm still lucky. I have an elderly practice, and they really treat me with respect. I mean, they stand up when I come in the door, the Portuguese patients, and call me Mr. Doctor. And the little old ladies cook me stuff, and the Russians bring me vodka, and the Jamaicans bring me rum, and everybody. They must all think I'm an alcoholic. Like, everybody brings me booze. And they're wonderful, LCBO tick and baking. And so I'm living the old Marcus Welby family doctor that we used to be, so I'm not good at commenting on that. I, I've always had respect, and and I, I've always, I've liked my pay. and the guy who sold me this practice, I paid for it when you didn't have to. He said to me, he said, "These are my friends," and that that's always been like that. Mm-hmm. That's great. If you weren't a doctor, what what would you have? <laughs> have you ever thought what you would yeah, do? Yeah, I, I would be a teacher. I was going to be a teacher because <laughs> I didn't get into medical school. I was dumb. I had 73. I would never be in today. You know, I had a 73 average in grade 13, 56 average in first year university because I partied my brains out. Then I got religion and got scared and pulled up my socks and got an 80 average getting into med school. Now you have to have a 90 average. So I would have been a teacher and I would have liked being a teacher. And I love to teach. I teach medical students and graduates and stuff. And I would have been retired, whoops, sorry, seven years ago on an index pension. No, 17 years ago. Are you going to retire? Never. When I die, my wife couldn't stand me at home. Like, I, I organize her at home, so she says, keep going to work and bringing home money. And But what I'm doing is I'm cutting back slowly. So I share with a nurse practitioner, and she's wonderful. And a lot of people don't realize nurse practitioners are the ultimate locums. They're way, locums are usually pretty tough, you know, because they're poorly trained and they don't show up and they're annoying they take your patients off work and give them narcotics and you have to come and reverse everything but she's been with me for four years and i pay her a hundred dollars an hour which everyone thinks i'm crazy but it's tax deductible so it's fifty dollars an hour locums 200 bucks an hour and she's wonderful and they can do everything i can do she can write for narcotics she can take away your license she can certify you insane she looks after my nursing homes my office a hundred percent she doesn't have to report to anyone else I just pay her. So it's fabulous. So she's doing more and more, and I'm doing less and less. So so I go to Florida for March and complain about the uh, the government full-time down there. And uh, then I take six weeks off in the summer at our cottage on Georgian Bay. And and she does Wednesday afternoons and Fridays. So, so she's doing more and more all the time. Like next summer, she's going to do... Uh, you know, like seven weeks, and uh, she's going to take over Thursdays for me in December. So I'm sort of having a slow retirement where she's doing more and more, and I'm doing less and less. So eventually, uh, they have a better union than us, so I still have to do the on-call. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 
so that's a very pleasant way to go out. And, and a lot of dark, and, and I urge you out there in podcast land, don't retire. Retirement is hard. Why would you retire? I mean, I love my job. I make lots of money. Like my retired friends are boring, you know, they're, they're daughtery. You get old, your brain starts to fail. There's one doctor in town who's 87 here who assists at surgery, loves it. He's wonderful. The surgeons say he's the best assistant there is. So, and if you're doing a good job, like don't do anything crazy. I mean, if you're just a GP and you can refer stuff to people, you know, you don't want to be doing surgery or eye surgery when you're 75 or that, mm-hmm. but... And that takes a lot of pressure off doctors because, especially nowadays with huge debt, they go, "Oh, I got to pay this debt off in the next few years." No, you don't. You know, I wasn't out of debt till I was sixty. Like you can work till you're seventy quite easily and enjoy it. So you don't have to, you know, pay off your mortgage and pay off your school debts. Uh, you can amortize it out there over forty or fifty years. Yeah, I remember one advice one doctor gave me was that. Um, uh, she gave the whole class this advice was that you know when you get out you'll be you'll move to a different earning bracket and then you'll think you have all this money and you start and you have a, a huge debt you know the average debt one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars you know after mm-hmm. medical school terrible. and then um, you think you got all this you're getting this bigger paycheck you're forgetting that the government's going to take half of it. And then you buy a yacht, you buy a BMW, and then you have what he called the golden shackles. Yeah. You're working just to pay off all the of debt, that. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I've, I know like many doctors are still in debt at age 60 because uh, I think the, the, the finances of it are, A, not handled properly, but it is also quite expensive. Yeah. It costs at least at, like a hundred twenty hundred fifty thousand dollars to run a practice oh i know and and yeah and people sp- uh, spend their gross instead of their net and yeah i urge doctors to put away for your taxes every month like don't put it away quarterly put it it just you should never even see that money it doesn't exist for you because you just love to, i love to spend i mean if you give me a dollar i'll spend it so i have to be protected from myself so i only have this little bit that i can deal with here the rest goes to pay for insurance and every, every everybody but me there, there's and a lot that's another stressor that you and that we didn't have you know when i went to school with 700 dollars tuition i just had a medical student in from western last week twenty nine thousand bucks and it's mm-hmm. even more if you go uh offshore i mean it's a hundred thousand dollars so it's so we're talking about burnout with doctors. There's another thing of burnout that I never had and older doctors never had was those huge. And just look at house prices these days, a million dollars for a dog house in Toronto. So I feel sorry for young doctors today, but but you don't ha- have to be burned out, but everything has a solution. Everything has a trick. So the trick is work longer. It's not a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. And, you know, Make sure you pay everything off every month. And you don't need that BMW. You know, you can buy a Chev. And I drive my cars for 10 years, 300,000 K. Like, as soon as you, if you turn your car over every four years, you're just paying the, the car company and the car dealerships. So these new cars are so wonderful. You can drive them safely for 300,000 K. So, you know, there's a trick right there. You don't have to do what the advertisers are telling you to do. They're trying to sell you those cars. You, they're all great. I mean, my 10-year-old car is just as nice as my my the one I, I got today. So, uh, Yeah, I, I really think it's about, like you say, you can, I don't see myself retiring either. It's like, and I think, you know, why, that's a good thing. Well, why I think people, think about retirement is because they're just not one of the things is that they're just not happy now yeah. and they're just yeah. working at such a pace that they're not playing the long game they're not realizing that you know i need to schedule the way i work so that i i can uh work longer but work at a level that is enjoyable and still competent i mean exactly. i think that's that's the key for that and I've always done that. I've always enjoyed my job, and I've always made good money. I mean, I make w- way more than the average GP, but I've always thought how to do it, and I've always paid attention. And my over- I only have a secretary. I don't have a nurse. I saved a million dollars not having a nurse. I do the nursing job. 
I weigh them, I do their blood pressure, I give the babies needles. As I'm talking to mom and dad, I'm multitasking. You don't need a nurse. I hate to say nurses don't beat me up. My mom was a nurse. My sister was a nurse. You don't need a nurse in your family practice office. I hate to tell everybody that, but I've written well, blogs about that. I do it. Just me and my secretary run this place. My wife does the billing. So I cut my overhead. You know, look, it's not the Taj Mahal. Patients don't care. I'm not a dentist that has to get business. So, and I, if you read my book or listen to my audio book, it'll tell you how to run your practice so you do get an hour and a half for lunch and you're home at five and you get a half an hour, half day off a, a week and eight weeks off a year and you can still make good money doing that. There is a way to do that. Yet you were never taught to do that uh, by the, the professors that taught you medical school never had to run a practice. They had you to do their job for them. You did their paperwork. They saw three people in a day. You come out here and you have to see 30 people in a day. So guess what you do? You just work longer and you don't take lunch and you get home at 7 and you're exhausted and you hate your job. So I teach you how to work smarter. Well, how I, do you do that? I I like having a nurse. Uh, I think it's they're invaluable. They sometimes connect with patients in a very special way. But, I mean, I, I hear your point. Yeah. Uh, I, and I loved to, mine. It was, yeah. broke my heart to fire her, and she's still my patient. So even when I see her, you know, 20 years later, I still feel horrible. But that million dollars went was nice. What, uh, really the kind of the last uh, serious question, because, you know, we, I think we've really been talking for an hour. Um, really? Wow. What um, what about college complaints? That's a thing okay. that you know you are really an expert at. You, yeah. you you've consulted with the CPSO, the Canadian you know College of Physicians and Surgeons, and what and you've been involved in you know how many like I can't remember how many thousands of cases uh, uh, you 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 you've been involved in so many. Yeah, I've done about over a hundred malpractice cases yeah. as an expert witness. So and what probably would, about thirty college complaints. So what? You didn't have thirty college no, complaints. Yeah, as an great. expert. Yeah, yeah, on the right side of it. Yeah. So I've had a college complaint, and I always say that to people. I've mm -hmm. been sued. I've had a college complaint, which makes me more empathetic too. You know, like I ain't perfect. I've made my share of mistakes, and so, it's horrible to go through them. Because. What advice would you give to young, middle, old, old uh, dealing with all doctors? Uh, with, yeah, uh, yeah, with the college complaint. How to? And once again, I have it's in my book. So to and malpractice suits them, and I've gone through them. So they're horrible. If you can do anything to avoid them, they go on forever. Like a malpractice suit will go on for ten years. I'm telling you, because the lawyers are making money by the hour. So there's no interest in them ever to quit i hope there's my cmpa lawyers aren't hearing that they're wonderful by the way cmpa lawyers are are fabulous they know more medicine than we do they're, they're just so brilliant because that's what they do so we're lucky to have them um but uh it's a horrible thing to go through a college complaint will take two years sometimes no they're speeding it up and they're they're really doing a good job and they're trying to make it quick because they know that it's a huge cause of burnout, just waiting, you know, just torturing us with waiting. So the best way to avoid complaints and malpractice is be nice to your patients. Like patients don't sue and complain to people they like. You can cut off their wrong leg and they won't sue you if they like you, if you have a good bedside manner. I know that sounds horrible. I'm glad I'm old because I can say these truths. If I was young, I couldn't say that, but it's true. I mean, I, I do these cases and they'll say, they sue everybody, but they'll say, don't sue my family doctor because I like him. And the lawyer will say, you've got to sue everybody because they'll just work each other again. You, you've got to blanket sue every. They even do a John Doe sue where they, they sue who was ever in the operating room and call him a John Doe and a Jane Doe nurse so the lawyer doesn't get sued because he left someone out. So if they like you, so be nice to people. Uh, you know, don't come to work tired and crabby. Don't come to work if you have a cold or the flu. Like, take the day off like the rest of the world does. Because that doesn't count. You can't say to the judge, oh, I, I felt lousy. It's just like saying a pilot says, I'm sorry I had diarrhea today and we crashed the plane. You know, I, sorry about that, folks. Well, you know, don't show up for your flight. So, uh, so be nice to people. Charting is... 99% of complaints and malpractice. If you didn't chart it, you didn't do it. And I'm a terrible charter, so I can speak, you know, like I'm a reformed hooker talking here. Uh, 
I'm a hor- hideous. I used to chart and emerge like a happy face with like uh, three stitches on a scar here. So I've had to learn how to chart, and I use templates and stamps. And once again, they're in my book how to do that, and the college endorses that. As long as they're not checklists, you have to you know fill them in. It's like the Rourke baby for everything. So um, be nice to people. Chart. Uh, for sexual stuff, always have a chaperone. And I can do that as a solo GP with one secretary. So my secretary, if I have an intimate exam, you know, breast or pap smear, I'll just say to the woman, okay, put on these gowns and drapes. And then I leave and I bring my secretary back in and she's got her Madonna phone on. So she's still on the phone and she's up there helping the the, uh, woman and handing me stuff and that and still running the office. So you can do it with one secretary. You can't say, oh, I'm a solo GP. I have nobody to come in and chaperone me. And so that's the kind of stuff. You've got your secretary, you know, a female in there with female patients. And and if you're a male or if you're a female doctor and you're doing with male, I don't know what they do. You'd have to ask a female doctor. I guess you'd have to get a chaperone of the same sex. So, And when you read that dialogue, as we all do, you know, all the poor people that got nailed in the college. A lot of the people I work with that got get into trouble with the college is they get spread too thin. You know, they're running three clinics and they're exhausted and they're running around and they're charting badly and and it looks bad. So, you know, stay focused, you know, just run one clinic and do a good job there. Don't get spread to that. That's that's the one thing I'm seeing. And once again, I was like that. So I'm good at this because I was like that. So I've I've been bad and then I've had to teach myself how to be good. I'm not some guy on high crapping on you. I'm the wonderful professor. I've always been perfect. I have been you. I've I've had four jobs at once trying to get two kids through university, pay off a mortgage, you know, and got in trouble. I flunked a peer review at my nursing home. Mm-hmm. And I had to get religion, you know. I thought I can lose my license here. Like, talk about scaring the hell out of you. And I, I did. I changed. I, I quit my job at the hospital. I quit my job at the retirement home. I focused on the nursing home. Did better charting. Had more time for. I brought my tricks to play. I was rushing. I was running around not charting, and they just look at the chart. So if you could be the greatest doctor in the history of the world if you don't chart it. It's mm-hmm. just your word against theirs, and so yeah, that the, the, those are all really valuable and good. Good and it's tips. just common sense, and, and common sense is often very uncommon. So and to reassure good. doctors in your audience, uh, they're not looking. The college and judges and juries and malpractice and CMP are not looking for some star. They want an average competent doctor, and that's. They bring in another family doctor to critique you or to support you. It's your peer. It's not what would an internist do with a heart attack or what would a neurologist do with a head in, a headache. What would a good family doctor do? Not a brilliant family doctor, not a genius. So we don't have to live up to some... Uh, you just do the best you can. They know we have 10 minutes per patient. You can't you can't pick up every zebra that runs down the hallway. But you want to say, if I don't know what the zebra is, I will refer it to an internist who will tell me. You don't just say, I don't know what your zebra is. Take a hike. You know, mm-hmm. like I don't know why you're losing weight. Beat it. Uh, I can't find out why you're losing weight. I've done a CAT scan of your abdomen. I've done all lab and that. I'm going to send you to an internist. Like cover your rear end. I don't know why you have fatigue. I'm going to send you to an internist. It may just be stress or depression. I don't know why I have night sweats. But so good for the patient, good for you, good for the CMPA. Win, 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 win. It's the doctors that go, I don't know why you have night sweats. You know, take a hike. That's They find out they got a lymphoma or sarcoidosis or something or typhoid fever or malaria. They're the guys that are in trouble and they get sued, and they get successfully sued because mm. a peer like me comes and says, I would have referred that patient. Right. It doesn't right. cost me any money or any time. I can refer with one keystroke. Yeah. What does that cost me? I, I've, I've had patients who have, you know, they should have been referred. I've seen them in the emergency room, and, and they, they, the patients have said, I've asked my family doctor to refer, and they, they, they haven't. <laughs> And I said, well, we'll send a referral over. Um, so I don't understand the thinking behind that. I, you know, uh, even when patients say, 
could you refer me to? Because it doesn't cost you I anything. Know. You know, I'm I'm very supportive of doctors. Like I think doctors are number one. If we have good doctors, it's good for patient care. Like I'm the most pro doctor in the world. They're my friends. They're me. I rarely criticize them, but that's one thing I criticize. When a patient asks for a consult, even if it's a stupid idea, why would you fight? It, first of all, it's easy. Like, bye-bye, you're done. And second, why would you antagonize them? If something goes wrong, they're mad at you, and they're going to sue and complain about you. Like, please, somebody out there, tell me why you're, you're not saving the taxpayer any money because they're going to go anyway, and they're going to go to a merge for 300 bucks, and the lawsuits and everything are going to cost millions of dollars. So... I, I always. It's just like I, I really. Somebody, please, in your audience, tell me. I had one case where I had a guy f- asked for four consoles. He was a, a rock and roll singer, smoker, and everything. He had a hoarse voice, and I said it's because you're singing and smoking. And he went to an ENT, who said the same thing. So he wanted a second ENT, and then a third ENT, and a f- so I finally stood up and said, you know, this is a ridiculous abuse of. Still my patient, still still yeah. hoarse, still singing, so. So that's once in my entire life where I stopped a, a stupid consult. I I really do think that uh, one one thing I always keep in mind is I always say, what would I do if that was me, my family member, my child, my wife, yeah, uh, my sister? Good. I mean, I don't have a sister, but you you, you know you, you you get you get the idea. That's a great way to and, live your life. And if and if. Uh, if I and and then I take the appropriate steps yeah. and uh, I think that has always served me well. I think that's a great idea. I want to ask you a few fun questions. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, do you have any pet peeves? Yeah, wait times uh, in Canada. That's the worst thing. And I I, I did a blog about uh, Medicare for all. Because the Americans now are all the Democrats are running on Medicare for all, and I always say pack a lunch. Because when you have a free system, you're going to have wait times. You have a free uh, restaurant, guess what? It's going to line up out the doors. And the wait times are worse now than they've ever been in 46 years. Mm -hmm. We have 14-month waits for gastroenterologists in Cambridge, which is, you know, we're an hour from three huge teaching centers, Toronto, Kitchener, and uh, Hamilton, and London, four. So that's ridiculous and disgusting and, and a Canadian shame. And I don't know the answer to that. And it's not throwing more of my tax dollars at it. Maybe getting more efficient. But that that's my that's really my only beef with the Canadian healthcare system. I think it's a pretty good system otherwise. Mm-hmm. But it's horrible. Okay. I'm sure it's worse than Chatham. Yeah, we, we, yeah, every every city, every town has a, uh, has that issue, I'm sure. So yeah, here's a fun question. Um, what... Do you have a, a motto or a, a message that you would put on a billboard? If, if uh... I wrote it here because oh, I wanted to get it right. Yeah. So doctor burnout is prevented, preventable and treatable. And the reason I say that is like most doctors just give up. Like half of doctors are burned out in, in the entire world. Like this is worse than the United States because they have to work for companies and they have more, more malpractice. So American doc, and they have lousier computers. So American doctors are even worse off than us, but we're pretty bad. And Europe is terrible, and England and Japan. It's a horrible problem everywhere uh, in the entire world. And and doctors just accept it. You know, they they just go, I'm just going to plod away and then retire. And what a horrible way to live your life. Like I love, I can't wait to go to work tomorrow. I when I'm on vacation, I can't wait to get back. To- I love this job. It's never boring. I love because I have practiced what I preached. I used to be burnt out, and I fixed my burnout. So you can prevent it if you're a medical student or a resident or a new young doctor, and even if you're a middle-aged or old doctor. Even if I've had sixty-five-year-old doctors come up to me, I had one come up to me on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. He was from Sarnia. He was a pediatrician from Sarnia. And he'd been on call for five years, 24-7, 365. Every single second for five years, he'd been on call. Wow. Like, that's torture. I mean, Mm -hmm. that is torture. How good can you be as a doctor? His wife had to march into the CEO's office and say, what does it take to get another pediatrician in this city? And all of a sudden, they found some money, you know, to hire fellows from Western to come out from London to help. But if they hadn't complained, they would have killed that guy. So you have to stick up for yourself. No one's going to look after you. Mm-hmm. 
You have you will get no help even from your spouse and friends. The only people you have is you. That's the only person. And people like me and you, we're happy to help out your fellow doctors. But no one else, everyone else thinks you're rich and you're not going to get any sympathy from anybody. Why should do you do you sympathize with teachers that make a hundred thousand dollars and get July and August off? Nobody does. So that's the way they think about us. They all think we make a million bucks and we're idiots. So so you have to look after yourself and put yourself. So it is burnout is preventable and it's tr- once you get it you can treat it. It's a fixable disease. It's not a terminal diagnosis. Good, good. Well, you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, I'll here's, here's uh, one final question. What book other than your own have you gifted uh, to other people? Or I really like Atul Gawand, and if you can spell it for oh, yeah. him. At- Atul, A-T-U-L-G-A-W-A-N-D, I believe. Right. Is, uh, yeah. He's a surgeon from New York City, a wonderful writer, writes for the New Yorker, New York Times books, and he's written a whole bunch of books. I urge you to Google him, buy all his books. He really can talk like a doctor, but he's a good writer, too. And that's hard. You know, mm-hmm. you have to, very few people are skilled at being both. He really gets the feeling out there of everything we do, you know. And that we, so I have gifted that to surgeon. For, like, I have one buddy that's a surgeon, and he never reads ever. He's, he just doesn't read, which I can't believe. I mean, I, I read everything from Mad Magazine to The New Yorker and everything in between. I read The Sun and The New York Times to get the whole spectrum. And The Economist, The Economist is a wonderful magazine. It's very broad. It's not just about money, and it's not just American. It's worldview. And, uh, but this Atul Gawand is fabulous, and I urge you, and I gave the, all his books to this surgeon buddy of mine, so that's the only time I've ever gifted a book. Was it Being Mortal? Was yeah, that, uh, being, the, yeah, but he's written a whole he's bunch. He's written a bunch, yeah. I yeah know. Read them all. They're yeah, absolutely he's very, he's very real good. doctor books. Nice, nice. Well, John, this has been fantastic. I um, thank you. How can the audience get a hold of you? Okay. Now, do you put stuff up? Yeah, on? I'll, I'll put yeah. I'll put it all in the show notes. I'll put uh, reference to sure. Atul Gawan's uh, books and his name. Oh, thank you. And, um, and so, then, just you're welcome to use my private email, uh, Dr. John Crosby at Rogers dot com. D-R-J-O-H-N-C-R-O-S-B-Y at rogers.com, like Bing Crosby. Uh, and just email me. I, I do that with everybody. I offer, and I'll send you my ebook for free. I will send you links to my audio books for free. It's on time and stress and risk management, you know, how to avoid burnout, how to be a good time manager, how to avoid stress, how to avoid malpractice and college complaints. And uh, there's a, a new book just came out called The Kindly Country Quack, and it's all the best of my blogs and lots of nice pictures in it, too. Um, I also offer free mentorships, too, which I've done with 63 doctors from across Canada. Now, where, no matter where you are in the world, what we do is we just talk on the phone at time that's uh, convenient for both of us. So, you know, 8 till 9 in the morning because none of you have any time to do this. That's the big problem. No one has time to be on time. So Mm -hmm. they'll say, I love your ideas, but I I don't have time to read your book. So you can listen to it while you're driving. And you can, while you're munching your sandwich at lunch between patients, uh, we do sort of a personalized mentorship. Uh, I just had a doctor write to me last week saying she was tired, 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 and went to her accountant and wants to quit and when when can she quit? She's been in 20 years. And, and he said, you have to work another 10 years to afford it financially. Mm. What a sad way to be. I mean, you don't have to be like that. I, I said to her, you have a treatable disease. Let's treat it. But it's going to, you don't do it like that. You know, change is hard and it takes a while to change things. Dr. Crosby, I want to thank you and I look forward to your thank future you. articles uh, in the Medical Post. Thank and you. Uh, this has been a true delight to thank you to talk sir. to you.